But if you pick someone that you have some trust challenges and issues with, then I'd ask you to step back and say, is it that you don't trust them or is it that you have low confidence in their integrity? Is it that you don't trust them or you have low confidence in their competence or you have low confidence in their compassion or combination? Hey, everybody, welcome to this week's episode. I'm here in the studio today with Richard Fagerlin, and we are going to be speaking about leadership as it relates to business, starting a business, growing a business, raising kids, and leaving a legacy here with the world. Check this episode out. Hey, thanks for tuning into this week's episode. Would you make sure to please like, comment, and subscribe to the channel here, and please share this episode with somebody whose life it will make better? Richard Fagerlin. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for being here. It's my pleasure, Matt. This has been this has been a long time coming. I showed you the podcast studio before it was up and live and yes. running. Yes. And we're we're in it. You're all over it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I love opening up every podcast with with how we connected. And uh, you and I met not too long ago. It's mm-hmm. been within really the last year. Year. Yeah. We were at a restoration project, uh, men's retreat, and I was told that I had to share bedroom yeah with somebody and i hate sharing bedrooms because i just i like my own space i don't necessarily like grown man sharing bedrooms it just doesn't feel right yeah but i snore like i snore shake the shake the room snore yeah and i was just worried i'm worried about that because i keep people up and then um i ended up not snoring at all but you did i did <laughs> i did it's, it's like a it's like a superpower <laughs> and you yeah and i was up and i and i was sleeping in and yeah. out and i was like man this guy can snore. So I've met, I've met a new, new friend. I'm like, a new snore friend. Long friends. Yes. Yes. We, it's a, it's a big club. We, we belong to the snores. Well, and then as we spent some more time together at the retreat, we were just comparing, you know, stories and upbringings and the you know mm-hmm. space we're in, we're out there speaking, and teaching and coaching, talking about leadership, uh, both Jesus followers and right. in the business space and just trying to make the world a, a better yeah. place. So I'm just really excited to, um, to hear your story and just, Gain, gain from your insight. So we'd oh. love to just love to hear a little bit about you and your background and just what, what got you here to, we're, we're down talking about our, not midlife crisis. We're not having a midlife crisis. But it's our midlife. We're having our midlife reflect back, look yeah. forward. Yeah. Really, really cool milestones that we've seen. Yeah. Um, but yeah, catch us up a little bit. How'd you get to where you are today? Well, the, the short, long version. I grew up on a, I grew up on a farm and ranch environment. So I grew up out in the country in the middle of nowhere. I was, you know, 20, 30 miles from town. Town was a thousand people. And I had uh, siblings that were older than me. The, the next old, the next youngest older sibling was seven years older. And then I had a little sister who was five years younger. So I was really by myself and spent, you know, all this time really with nothing to do, but use my imagination and so I had a horse and I had a bike and I had, you know, trouble to make on out, out in the country. And, you know, that's really where like my creativity and my ingenuity started. So I'll go through that, went, you know, went through school, was always involved in, always involved in leader things, you know, like if there was a office to run for or a, you know, place to volunteer or something to do, that was great. Right out of high school, I, I didn't go to college. I volunteered in a youth organization as an officer in that organization, traveled all over the country. I actually got to go to Europe for a month. Whoa. So, you know, delayed college. Went to college, had wor- worked my way through college, paid paid for everything. So I was always working 20 to 40 hours a week, put myself through school. And then I took an internship for a really large business that did youth leadership training as kind of part of its philanthropy, its way to reach out to its customers and members. And when I graduated from college, I got the opportunity to run that program. So immediately out of college, I'm running this leadership development program. I've got a team of people that are working for me, interns. Um, So I got exposed to a lot of really cool things in that job. And because of that exposure, I got to see, you know, really up close and in person, not just youth leadership, but like leadership at the highest level. This is a fortune 120 something company. And I got to interact. Uh, there was, you know, I was, I was interacting with people in, in, you know, VP and C-suite positions and, and I'm a student, like I'm curious to this day. I'm very, very curious. So I was watching a lot and seeing, so that's, you know, really what, um, kind of gave me my background. And then, um, the, the, again, the short, shorter version of this is nine 11 happened, um, September 11th. And, uh, 
I'm thinking, what on earth am I here for? What's my purpose? Why, why on earth, God, did you put me on this earth and for what reason? And it really caused me to think about what I wanted to do in the future. And so over the next couple of months, my wife and I were talking, praying, you know, seeking wise counsel. And in November, as a matter of fact, yesterday, I just thought about it, yesterday is the 22nd anniversary of me waking up and calling my boss and quitting my job. And congratulations. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Dude, 20, that's awesome. Yes. Love it. 22 years ago, I quit my job and started Peak Solutions, my consulting practice. And honestly, if I'd have known then what I know now, I don't know that I would have had the courage to go through with that. So I quit my job on Monday and Wednesday, the day before Thanksgiving, uh, my wife comes to me with a positive pregnancy test. So we already had one kid at home, 18 months old. Okay, so you've got one. One on the okay. ground. And th- I'm like, this was not in the business plan. You, you know, know where they come from, right? Yeah, I okay. know how this happens. So you know how this all works? I, this, okay. that, I mean, a little surprise. You know? <laughs> and um, Preston, who turns 22 this summer, um, just got engaged. He's, he's you know graduating from college this year. He, he, we found out we were pregnant with him the same week, two days after I quit my job. So there's no turning back. There's no... Like, I've got to make this work. And um, that's that's really the impetus for how things started. And, of course, we got 22 years of distance from then till now. But you, you said you wouldn't have done that. Was that because of baby number two, because of Preston coming along, or was it just you didn't know what that journey was I think was that what be? I had was I had, I had a lot of self-confidence. I had a lot of faith. I knew that God was in it and that there was a purpose to what I was doing. All that was clear. Yeah. What I didn't have was how scary this is, what challenge this would be. And if I'd have known all of that, I might have said, you know, maybe I should wait a little bit. Maybe I should save a little bit of money. Maybe I should, you know, grow practice on the side. You know, like the the later wisdom would have would have told would have kept the moxie from the young guy from just jumping, burning the boats and going. And I'm I'm yeah. grateful that I didn't know it. But you, but you burned the boats. I mean, you were burned you were them. all in, so you yep. couldn't go back to the boss and say, "Oh, I was just, I was just kidding." Just Can kidding. I come back like part time while <laughs> no. I while I grow this? So then, what what were those initial steps like? We have a lot of business mm-hmm. leaders, business owners, people thinking of making that jump. Um, how how were those first couple of weeks, months? Yeah, sometimes day by day, right? When yeah. you're in that space, absolutely. I I immediately um, I knew I needed to like get a baseline of, of revenue in. So I, I immediately grew a couple of retainer clients that brought in, you know, enough money to know that I'm going to be able to pay my mortgage and, you know, put a little food on the table, you know? And so I jumped out early to try and get that taken care of. But I knew, I knew at the beginning that I didn't want to um, just go take any kind of work. And, and I really wanted to build something lasting so I, I had told myself at the very beginning that I wanted to to give it two years to really find out, let my clients decide who they should be, you know, let let yeah. let the type of work that I was doing um, show up in in you know what's what's most important. So I could what I what was in my original business plan, what I ended up doing are very very different, and I'm thankful that I had the ability to just pause for a couple of years. I didn't, you know, the thing about it is. 22 years ago, my the needs that I had to provide for my family then <laughs> versus now uh, are very, very different. So yeah. that was helpful that I didn't have to, you know, go bring in a ton of money. I could just kind of replace my salary for the first, you know, six to 12 months before I worried about really building, a, you know, business out. Yeah. What, what were some of the big milestones that you hit? So you got that, you know, initial bucket filled yeah. right with some retainers but what were those other big milestones and then maybe maybe even transitions that that have kind of led you to where you are today yep i landed one big client that that uh i you know i had known because i'd worked in the in big business i knew that consultants from the outside that let's just say charged five hundred dollars versus five thousand dollars um that that the value that you see in them based on how much they're charging is commensurate Mm-hmm. So yeah. my rates were really low for that first year or two, and I got a chance with this one big client. And so when they asked for my rate structure, I more than doubled everything and landed it. And then, so that was a new plateau. And that client was great because I got exposure at a very high level 
in a larger, you know, more complex organization. And that led to larger, more complex other organizations. And it changed the rate structure and it changed, it honestly changed how I saw myself because uh, they, they, they agreed. And so that was a, that was a huge bump plateau. Isn't that nice? I know like my journey as a, as a speaker, I remember, you know, the, the certain dollar amounts and you throw that big one out that you're always shooting for. They go, okay. Yeah. Oh, well, and then the next one. Okay. Yeah. And now it's time to yeah keep that ball moving. Right. So that's really, that's really cool. What, um, what lessons would you go back and tell Richard from 22 years ago? Hmm. Well, I've, I've shared this before and I'll, as, as long as people ask the question, I'll keep sharing and the answer is going to be the same. I, uh, what I would tell him, what I would, what I would say to this, this young entrepreneur is that, um, one, you don't own the business, like God owns the business. Number yeah. two, this is not your job. You are a business owner and the business needs to eat first. So I would have changed the way that I saw finances. So typically what, how early on I saw things was whatever's in the bank is mine and whatever I need, I pull from it. And my wife on, on a scale, uh, on a continuum of risk, uh, she's at one end and I'm at the other. And, you know, so I'm high risk, willing to take the chance, willing to, you know, eat ramen for a year if I need to. And, and she, she wants stability. And I didn't really honor that early on. And I put her under a lot of stress and, um, it was undue and it, and it caused challenge for her challenge for me. So I would have went back and I would have structured things so that the business had its own fund, so to speak, and it paid us a salary. Yeah. And I would have done whatever I needed to do to keep that fund full and to live within our means instead of we'd have times of many and times of less. And we just yeah. would, you know, go back and forth. So, so I would have changed the way I thought about the business for one. And then the other is I, I, um, you know, the one thing I'm very grateful for is I've never along the way, like been a workaholic. I've always wanted a work-life balance. Um, I probably would have along the way somehow figured out how to include my my kids a little bit more and expose them a little bit more into the to the running of a business. You know, they can't do what I do, um, but but to help have them be involved a little bit more, I, I would have advised myself to do that. So question about back back to your wife, to the the spouse, were you aware of that? difference in risk tolerance, those differences in personality styles. Emily was on the podcast a couple episodes ago yeah. and we talked about like, we weren't, we weren't aware of our personality differences and we, we butt heads, there'd be friction, friction, stress because of that. And then once we learned that, it was like, Oh, okay, I've got to slow down here or explain more details here. Were you yeah. aware? Yeah, back? I think, I think I was aware, but I think my, I think my give a crap was pretty low, Matt, you know, the, I was aware, it's clear, you know, that we see this differently. And instead of honoring that, I think it, I used it as a, you know, back away, I'm trying to build something for us. And, you know, it just became noise versus, you know, what do you really need? And um, we just didn't have good communication about it. So it was frustrating for both of us. Both of us were, you know, probably if we really want to be honest, both of us were immature with each other in that and um, time helps you with that. So today yeah. we're much more mature in our conversations. So instead of talking about it, we probably, you know, had, you know, unwise lashing out at each other or, um, you know, probably some bitterness or frustration. And, and what else would you give to, you know, talking and piggybacking off of that for new entrepreneur, entrepreneurial couple, somebody who just, you know, you burn the boats, maybe spouse is a little bit more conservative. Yeah. How, how do you initiate those conversations? Like what would be some, some advice, some reflection for maybe a younger couple? Yeah. Right? I think the couple should sit down and share what are they comfortable with and to, to go into, to go into a business with what you're comfortable with, you're never going to be successful. Comfort does not breed success. Uh, actually comfort shrinks comfort. So, so for those of you who are less risk tolerant, if you want to be comfortable, then you also probably won't have amazing success. Hey, just want to give a big shout out to one of our sponsors, Imprint Digital. If you're a small business owner, one of the things that you need to navigate to be successful is all things online and digital in terms of marketing and your messaging. 
Imprint Digital, they are the real deal. They are the professionals and they know this world inside and out. Make sure to visit their website at imprint-digital.com. A big shout out and thank you to one of our sponsors, M&D Painting and Roofing. M&D was actually founded by my wife, Emily, and I back in 2005. And for the last two decades, we've been here in northern Colorado of one of the leaders in residential and commercial repainting, as well as most recently installing residential roofs. So if you need to paint, re-roof, you got hit by a hailstorm, we can take care of whatever your home needs from top to bottom. You can find us on the web at mandepainting.com. So which is more important? Like, so I would challenge them, okay, what are you comfortable with? And then what's like the next two tiers outside of that comfort and start talking about that. So like, there's this idea that you have your comfort zone yes, and then you have your growth zone and you have your learning zone and then you have your panic zone. But then at the end and outset ring of that, you have your danger zone. And so yeah. what's the danger zone? The panic zone I want to be aware of, but the learning and the growth zone I also want to be aware of. And likely as an entrepreneur, you're going to live in the learning and growth and probably touch into the panic regularly. And so like, I think that young couple should sit down and talk about what are in those areas. And if, if the spouse only wants to live in the comfort zone and they don't feel comfortable at all outside of that, I think that you should consider whether entrepreneurism is for you. I really do. Yeah. Because what's more important for you to be an entrepreneur or for you to have a meaningful, loving relationship with your spouse? I like that. I like that a lot. I love how you defined those, those zones. Yeah. And do you, do you tangibly put just, just numbers to it? Is it emotional capacity yeah. I mean, when you're looking at those? those yeah. Zones? Like in my world as a consultant, uh, the conversations we would have is like, how many days are you, w are you willing to be home alone with these children without me there? Like how much travel are you comfortable with? Um, what, what amount of money in our savings or how much money do we need per month to live on? Yeah. Um, what, what do you, when I went, what, uh, how much are you willing to reinvest back into the business? Like those kind of conversations and say, you know, okay, well, I'm comfortable with you reinvesting nothing. Okay. Well, that's not going to work. So if we move it out, how about a thousand a month? How about 10,000 a month? Like what's mm -hmm. the, you know, what are the numbers and how are we going to get there? Then it's my job to go grow, build and strengthen the business so that it accomplishes what needs to be accomplished. So some things it's not that you can't do this now, you can't do this at all. It's just that maybe you can't do it now. Yeah. Love it. Love it. So you've mentioned, and, and I mean, we, we both know this, but you're a Jesus follower. You're a faith based man. Yes. You're very bold about that. Very yeah. open about that. Yeah. How do you, how do you bring your faith into the, the marketplace and yeah. what would you share with, you know, faith-based entrepreneur, because I didn't do it for a long time. I thought that you really you had to be really careful about that line. Like this is business. You don't talk about this here. Um, and I've been really jumping and pushing into that space and it's been really interesting. Yeah. So just talk about that, that well, journey. Did you grow up? Did you grow up as a Jesus follower? I did not grow up as a Jesus okay. follower. Um, my mom came to a radical, a radical uh, repentance and, and faith in Jesus, like literally standing on the roof of our home on fire. She made a pact with God. If he'd save our house and our family, she would give her life to him. Your house is on fire? Yeah, I'm 14. House is on fire. My mom crawls up. My mom can't crawl up on a, you know, she didn't like platform shoes, let alone a table or a chair, but she climbed up on the roof somehow. And we lived six miles outside of town, volunteer fire department. Um, a neighbor happened to see our chimney explode at 1230 in the morning. She's out on a dirt road with her boyfriend <laughs> and sees our, our chimney explode and runs home, doesn't call 911, calls 411 because it goes to the town operator, you know, like <laughs> that's how small the yeah, town exactly. is. Hey, Sally. <laughs> hey, Sally, the Fagerlund's house is on fire. And then, then you know, this is in the 80s. Uh, there's, you know, it's not pagers and beepers and everything. So then a fire alarm goes off and the volunteer firemen get up, put their stuff on, head to the fire department, get in the truck and head out within 10 minutes of the phone call coming, the firemen show up and put the fire out. But my mom had been, had been, uh, God had been pursuing my mom at that time. And she'd watch a couple Billy Graham crusades on TV. And, um, you know, we weren't church going people and she just had this authentic interaction with Jesus. 
So mind you, I go from, you know, my mom is not a Jesus follower and, you know, doing things that were embarrassing to me, you know, at, 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 you know, and then next thing you know, she's a radical Jesus follower, praying every day, anointing things. I'm like, this is too much for me. So it took a couple of years for me to like understand what that meant. Um, but little, little country church had an awesome spirit filled pastor. Um, I went to a, um, an ex hell's angel came to our school for a just say no to drugs type of talk. He was the speaker. He was the speaker. And okay. so the whole school auditorium filled, you know, all 200 of us in high school. That's how many were in our high school, very small school. Um, he's given this talk. And at the end of the talk, he says, Hey, if you want to hear my story, if you want to hear what really is going on in my life, come, come after tonight. And so I'm thinking we're going to show up and he's going to tell us about all the people he killed and all the drugs he did. And so I'm, I'm captain of the football team and, and uh, fellow captain and I were like, Hey, everybody, let's go to this. It's free hot dogs. We're going to hear mean Gene talk about how bad he is. So our whole football team shows up to this hot dog feed and listen to him and a total revival takes out. And, you know, half of my, half my football team gets saved and, you know, that was the start of my faith journey. Um, truth be told, I didn't get discipled. Um, I got a Bible. I, I, I learned who Jesus was. I became interested. I now knew what my mom had seen. It was authentic and real, but I'm 17 years old, and it didn't become real for quite a while. Yeah. Uh, it's probably the end of my college career where I met my wife, actually, and yeah. that's what motivated me to turn my face to Jesus and... So when we started dating and putting our life together and got engaged, that's when authentically I really started to submit my submit my life to Christ. Now, did you did you have a big fire on the roof kind of a moment, or was it a slower? Some no. some people do, right? Yeah. They just all of a sudden they have this experience in a really deep way. Some's more of just a gradual leaning into it. Yeah, no, mine was gradual. It was like this makes sense to me. I want to do this. Problem for me was. My wife was a, like, she was born a Christian. I mean, she was just like born perfect. She was like very born, very, you know, um, convicted. And so yeah. she, she had grown up in private Christian school. She knew the Bible. Well, I was like, I can't even navigate through this thing. I don't have anything memorized. I don't know anything. And so I felt this distance between her knowledge and my knowledge was the problem. And once I realized that it was really just my relationship and it wasn't about, you know, how much do I know? Then I'm like, okay, I can do this. And then actually what happened was we got married and joined a little tiny community church in Liberty, Missouri, and got into a small group. I didn't even know that was a thing. I didn't know. I didn't know. I never heard of it. And so all of a sudden I'm 24 years old, 25 years old. I'm going to a small group with a bunch of other people my age who've been following Jesus for a long time. And I was like, that's what it looks like? Well, I can do that. Yeah, I can do that. And that was two years that just really changed the trajectory of our family. And I love that. Yeah. I love that. And then how, you know, ra raising, raising kids, right. And exposing them to that, but then letting them also make that decision. We were just talking about, you know, I've got Riley, he's 16, yeah, 16, Haley's 13. You know, they, they follow Jesus. Have they had that real deep connected experience yeah. with him? Has it just been because they see mom and dad do it, but like how, what, what would you share with, you know, parents, yeah, Christ following parents that, that are raising kids. Like, how do you, you know, you got to educate them, cycle yeah. them, but they've got to make that call themselves. I think it's got to be theirs. Man, this is, this is my answer. And you put 50 people in this seat and ask that same question. I hope they have different answers. So I'll give you my answer. And I just encourage everyone to, you know, take what of this maybe makes sense for them and what doesn't, you know, let it go. But we are grown adults with fully functioning brains who have been pursuing this forever, praying into our kids to have the same thing. And then you're asking a 16-year-old to have the same authentic love for Jesus. I don't think it's reasonable. Yeah. And so I think one of the things that parents do is that they expect that their kids have the same kind of faith that they do. And when they don't, they start getting freaked out. And I think that young people need to challenge that. I think that they need to be in a place where it's safe to say, I don't know what I believe about this or, you know, we just had a death in the family and, or, a you know, a girlfriend broke up with me or some challenge happens. And instead of us expecting that they lean on their faith, like we do, we should be encouraged when they question it. 
because God's pursuing them in that whole way. So I think that, you know, as a parent, my job is to help my kids be thirsty and hungry, hungry for the word and thirsty for the spirit, you know, to be in a place where they, they know where home is. They know what truth is that, that they, that they authentically see it, that they see it. uh, They, they're going to see hypocrisy, you know, between 16 and 25, your hypocrisy meter is like the highest it's ever going to be. And you and I are hypocrites and we should be called out on that. And we should be open to that. And the kids see it in the parents all the time. <laughs> it's their su- it's their superpower at that point. And so this humility from us to ask forgiveness and to, you know, show that we're not perfect and to, you know, sh- you know, show them some disciplines. There's some spiritual disciplines that are important, and to to help them know what to reach for. You know, it's kind of like let's just take it to food. You want your kids to eat healthy. But when you're not there, what does it look like? So we've, over the years, had a lot of kids come through our house, a lot of good Christian kids. And you can tell the ones that parents have never let them drink soda, eat candy, have you know stuff that happens to be in our house. And they go to that, and they just boom, eat it. You know, There's times when I'm like, I'm sorry, your 16-year-old had soda for the first time at our house. I really want to apologize. What I want to do is I want my kid who's never had soda to go to someone else's house and not crave it, to crave something else. Yeah. When I'm not there, because there's a lot of things I can do when I'm there. Yeah. And then we're learning like we're only there for so long. Right. Right. Because your, right. your, your kids are out, moved out. And yeah. So you got one getting married. Yes. One engaged uh, and, you know, one in the workforce full time. And, you know, praise God, they when 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 trouble comes bearing for them, the thing they reach for is is their faith. Yeah. And they've done it on their own. And. They would have done that when they were in high school, and they would have done that in early college because they would have known that was the right thing to do, but they're doing it now because it's what they crave and what they want. And uh, I've prayed a lot of prayers for my kids, but the the number one prayer that I've prayed most consistently is that they would hear the voice of God and respond. Yeah. Love it, man. Mm. So you you travel mm-hmm. all over the world, mm-hmm. speak about leadership. Mm-hmm. You wrote an amazing book. Trustology. Yeah, talk talk about the book journey a little bit and how, how that how that came about. Yeah, you shared a really fun story that uh, there was a lady on a plane with the book. Yeah. in front. Did you let her know that you wrote that, or you? Just no, we were, we were getting that? on an airplane, and that's got to be cool, right? Well, it's weird. It's yeah. just weird. Yeah, it's cool, but it's you know, if I had known people would read it, I might have done a little, <laughs> a little, a little harder work. Um, so. I, I never intended to write a book. Actually, you know, the book's on trust. Um, what happens, I was, I was speaking at a conference of realtors, of all things, and um, I was like, what do you want me to talk about? And so I'm going through my library of content, not things that I want to talk about. And I'm, I gave them a list. Like I could talk about mastering difficult moments. I could talk about conflict. I could talk about communication. I could talk about trust. And as soon as I said that, the conference organizer was like, yeah, 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 talk about trust. And so that was the first time I'd ever talked about it. And while I was talking about it, I said something in the middle of my presentation that I'd never said before, never thought before, never heard before. And the audience looked at me like I was a fool. And they actually all started challenging me, like stop me while I, once I said this and were asking me questions and really challenging me. So I had, I had two choices at that point. I could, I could tell them, listen, time out. I never thought of this before. Just kidding. Or I could try and walk myself out of the corner and respond. So the thing I said was trust isn't something that you earn. It's something that you give. And if you never give it, you're never going to get it. And that didn't go over well. And I didn't say it as with such conviction then no. <laughs> it just came out. It just came out. I wish I had a recording of it to, you know, hear that first time. And so I started like, well, wait a minute. And I started explaining why that was important. And when, when we were done, everyone looked at me like, okay, that's interesting. And on my drive home, I started thinking about that and it haunted me. And so I started thinking about all kinds of things. But one, I think that the gospel tells us that that's true. I really do. Um, you know, God tells us in Proverbs to trust in him with all our heart, all, mind, and soul yeah. and to lean not on our own understanding and yet we tell everybody, well, you got to earn their trust. You got to earn their trust. And that's just not a gospel centered approach. It's not a, 
it's not an accurate approach. So the more I thought about it, the more I researched it, the more I turned it in my life into a laboratory, the more people wanted to hear that message. So we have a we have a, a leadership development program that's multiple days. And so what we started doing, this is like 15 years ago, maybe even more, we started doing the last half day of that program on trust. And I just kept putting more into it and more into it. And people loved it. And so then they would, you know, they would say, hey, I have this conference coming up. Can you talk about it? So I just started speaking about it, started teaching about it, started using my life. So I did that for five or six years. And every time I would be done, one or two people would come up to me and say, do you have a book on this? Do you have, like, nobody's talking about it this way. And I sat out to write a book and I just started writing and I gave my wife what I'd worked on. So I went to this, you know, coffee shop and I put my headphones on and I started writing for a couple hours and gave it to her. And she's like, this is trash. This is Ooh. terrible. There's nothing in here that's good. It's the first, first pass. <laughs> yes. <It's trash>. Yes. <laughs> and, and, um, but she was right. And there was only a couple of things in there that really resonated. And she said, flush that out. And so I, I basically just put it on the shelf for a couple of years and then, I got to a place where I didn't need to write a book. I felt convicted that I needed to leave a message for people who wanted to know more. And the book was the best way to do that. So about 10 years ago, I sought out to do this. And in about five or six months, went from nothing to the published book. And yeah, so a year or two later, I'm on an airplane and I see someone with the book in their hand. And, you know, every month I'll get a, I'll get a text from someone who you know, walks into someone's office and a book's there. Or my favorite is when other people are on airplanes and they see someone with the book, they're like, hey, I know that guy. I know that guy. I know Richard. <laughs> yeah. So that initial, when you when you shared that, that trust trust isn't earned, you need to go have it first. Yeah. To get it. That, that was initially challenged. Mm -hmm. And then did you challenge back in that realtor conference or were you just kind of taken back as the speaker, all of a sudden the audience is coming at you a little bit, right? Yeah. I, I've been I've been in those situations and that that's stressful. I defended my point. Yeah. And I didn't know yeah. how to defend it. So I just okay. started like reaching for why that was true. Yeah. And and it and and it started resonating with people. So then with with that idea, right? So ha having full trust in trust in God, trust in yourself, trust in the other person is the premise of that like play play that out in a in a business scenario or or a parenting scenario yeah how that how that plays out well we have this a, kind of an it's it's a flip yeah it's Public. a flip it's absolutely it's a contrarian approach yeah. and here's the problem matt is that we don't have the same we don't all have the same vocabulary understanding around this word so you could take 10 people and ask them what does trust mean to them they're going to have different answers. So we have to, in order for this to make sense, we have to come to a common understanding. And so a lot of people, when they think about trust, it's like, can I totally trust someone or can I not trust them at all? It's like, it's a zero sum game. Either you've won it mm -hmm. or you've lost it. And there's no continuum in between. So it's important to, to get to the ground level. So we talk about trust as it's, it's a confidence in your relationship with one another. So you and I, all right, so let's just use, go you, with you and I. We have a relationship. And this confidence of how much can you trust me could be high, it could be low. Yeah. And so the, the, the way that this really all of a sudden starts to make sense is we break trust down into three categories. So really, it's not an issue of trust. It's an issue of your confidence in three categories. The first category is someone's integrity. If your life or business are cluttered up with junk right now, then you've got to reach out to one of our sponsors, Hulk Addicts Hauling. Hulk Addicts can come out to your home or business to do anything from removing junk to appliances. Maybe you're demoing or doing construction on a property and you need it cleared out. Maybe you need a big dumpster dropped off that they can roll off later. Make sure to check them out at hulkaddictsjunk.com. They are serving all of Northern Colorado as well as up and down the Front Range. Hey, if you're a business owner and you need to do some renovation in your space or possibly build a building from the ground up, you have to connect with one of our sponsors, Mendel Construction. Mendel Construction is a commercial construction company that's been around since 1997, serving all of Colorado. They can do a small tenant finish all the way up to ground up construction of a new building for your business. Check them out at mendelandcompany.com. That's M-E-N-D-E-L and company. 
Hey, if you're a Christian business owner, you have to check out one of our sponsors, the Foundry Advisory. The Foundry is a Christian peer advisory group where we get together on a monthly basis to discuss everything that's important in our life, our business, our families, and our faith. I'm a member and I love being a part of this group. You've got to check them out at thefoundryadvisory.com. When you go to their website, make sure you check out their refresh event, which is happening January 11th through the 13th, 2024 up in Estes Park. That can be found at thefoundryadvisory.com forward slash refresh. Do they say what they, do they do what they say they're going to do? Do they do the right thing even when no one's looking? Are they the same person no matter what? So integrity has that root form of the word that also the word integer has Mm -hmm. and an integer is a whole number yeah and so this idea of wholeness is important as a matter of fact one of my favorite things to do is when i have a when i just have a speaking engagement it's not like a long-term um you know consulting agreement and and i'm going somewhere fun i do like to take one of my kids with me so for years i've always done this and once the book came out at the end of the speaking engagement i'll have a book signing and so I, I was in um, Milwaukee, and I was having a book signing, and my son Preston, um, who is the, 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 the surprise, oh, you're having number the baby, two. number two, okay. he's with me, he's 14, and I'm, I'm having conversations with people doing a book signing, and I look over, and the line of people to talk to him <laughs> is as long as the line of people to talk to me. And the reason is, every one of those people were going to him was like, is your dad, is this really, is your dad really this guy? Like we just listened to him for an hour. Is this the real deal? And give I the, give me the dirt on dad. Exactly. And it's because they want to know, is this a person of integrity? Yeah. And so that's one of the legs of the stool. And it's important to be an integrous person. The second leg of the stool is, is around competence. And this is where in the work world in particular, this really plays itself out. Are, are you competent? Can I trust you to do your job? And it used to be that competence was how much do you know? How many knowledge, skills, and ability yeah. do you have? Today, I don't think it's so much as that. I think it's more how easily can you acquire knowledge? Can you broker it to other people? Can you take what you know and help someone else know that just as quickly? Because in our environment today, we can't know all the things we need to know to do our job. But how quickly can we learn that? And so competence is one way that we're looking at people. So it's like, do I trust you or are you incompetent? And so, vocab- again, vocabulary yeah. matters. And then the third leg of the stool is compassion. And compassion is this idea of how much do you care about me? How much am I known by you? Am I needed by you? Do you care for me? And compassion isn't always touchy-feely, lovey-dovey. Sometimes the most difficult things that you can say and do are done through compassion, Um with a lot of our clients, one of the things that we do the most is help them to understand when someone's become damaged goods, the very best thing you can do is let them go and be, because they're held hostage, they can't succeed. So anyways, those three legs are important. Well, I love that example when you say somebody you know, held, held hostage right, or uh, da- damaged goods, it, they start lacking one of those legs say as a, as a team member and then you as the leader need to, right. Need to part ways there. Right. So what we do, and I would encourage anyone who's listening, who's challenged with this is pick two or three people that you don't, that you don't trust quote, Mm. or that you have some trust issues with. And it has to be someone that you care for that to improve. Cause there's people I know that I, I would say I don't trust them, but I don't care to trust them. Like I just navigate around them. (laughs) But if you pick someone that you have some trust challenges and issues with, then I'd ask you to step back and say, is it that you don't trust them or is it that you have low confidence in their integrity? Is it that you don't trust them or you have low confidence in their competence yep. or you have low confidence in their compassion or combination? But but I think for me, like literally up until this point that you broke all that down, I just, I look at trust as a gut feel. It has just something about, you know, we had to let somebody go from, one of the businesses mm-hmm. over, you know, the time we've had all the businesses mm-hmm. without getting too much into the details. And it always came down to, I just didn't, just didn't trust this person. Mm-hmm. There was some, there was something, something about it. Mm-hmm. And now that I look at that, yeah, competent in abilities to do the job, but in certain interactions, just that it was a total lack of compassion, just this heartless, very heartless approach, which made me then question, 
you know, the integrityness of this. You know, how can you say that you stand for this and want to work for a company like this? And this person would stand up and share how biblical they were, yeah. right? All of this, but then I'd look at it play out. So I think that it didn't that, match. That's really cool that you can put some put like a grading rubric almost right. to that or a way to really break it down. Well, if you tell me you don't trust me, that's not helpful to me. But if yeah. you tell me that I'm a bull in a china shop and I come around and I don't care about people's feelings and that I just say whatever's on the top of my mind at no cost and I, I'm lacking compassion, that's yeah. helpful for both of us. And then you can put some some parameters to it, right? You right. can put some goals or some readjust right. or or not. Right. Or you just or you cut it loose. Right. Yeah, I love that. Love that. Yeah. What's been what's been your craziest coolest speaking speaking engagement memory of you know 20 years consulting yeah. traveling um i think you were heading to brazil yeah at, right after we met and that was going to be a pretty cool conference for you yeah i you know they're all they're all cool and crazy i do not i interestingly i do not consider myself a speaker <clears throat> you know i i speak so that i can do the other work uh the other work does not drive speaking so to me speaking is like a an outpouring of the other work that we do. My preference is to be in a room of 12 people over multiple days, really advancing meaningful things. I have come to really value speaking because it's a dedicated time period where you can impart a lot of insight to a lot of people. And if every one of them can move five or 10% for a period of time, it's helpful. So I, I take serious my platform. I don't know if this would be interest, you know, if you, you experience this, but I feel like I'm going to throw up every single time I speak, every single time I speak. Yes. I get nervous. Yeah. Um, I, I get anxious. Mm -hmm. I pray God empty me. Do not let this be about me. Give me a humble posture and spirit. Yeah. And, and ends up, he ends up honoring that a lot yeah. of times. I was uh, I follow Simon Sinek. I remember I remember seeing him speak before he really hit it big. He just spoke here locally in Denver. This is before anybody knew who he was, and he had a speaking coaching video. You know, he talks about hey, you know that pit in the stomach. You get the butterflies in the stomach and the sweaty palms. He goes, that's that's nervousness or anxiety, but that's when you're very self focused. You know, what are people going to think of me? How are they going to respond to what I say up there on my stage, versus just the go out and serve people. And it's this excitement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get it. I mean, I've, I've done a lot of speaking and I still get it. I was just at a conference and I'm in the hotel room, right? They're all out at the, the meet and greet and the party. And I'm closing this conference that had 14 speakers over two days for a gentleman that's like really well known in, in the business and leadership industry. It's his 64th annual conference. And I'm the keynote. And I'm there participating in the event. The first speaker comes out and just crushes it. I'm like, wow. You know, and then they keep going, oh, there's Matt. He's the keynote. So I'm in the hotel I'm, and I'm going through Painted Baby. And I mean, just, I don't know if you get this, but the, yeah, you should pack it up and you should pack it up and go. Yeah. Like, do, you, do you, I do. Do you get that? Oh yeah. I mean, I pray that the, it's, you know, the, it's the power would go out and everybody leave yeah. and I could just go home. And, um, so there's, and, and, and it could be 20 people. It could be 5,000 people. You know, the thing in Brazil had a stage that was 67 meters wide and, there was like 30,000 people at this conference. Not as many were in the, you know, the session. Yeah. Um, and, and what I try and do is just be authentic Richard. And whether I'm talking to 20 or, t you know, 5,000, I want to, I want, I want a message to get across. I want people to feel like I'm talking to them with them about something that's important to them. Yeah. I want it to be practical. I don't want it to be about me. And so I've had, I've had really great experiences. I would, I would say more than the stage or the platform experience, the ones that have been best for me are the ones where I have really great conversations with people afterwards yeah. and, um, or I interact with folks. I actually, I, I, I ran into a woman, um, who named her business something, trust something was in her new business. She became a human resource consultant and like 10 years after she heard me speak, she we, she saw me at another conference. And she goes, I need you to know that the last five years I've been running this business and I heard you speak at this conference and it made such an impact that I quit my job, started this business, and I'm, you know, trying to, you know, usher in high trust relationships and organizations around, you know, all of my clients. And so those, yeah, that kind of stuff's fun. That's really cool. 
That's really cool when somebody comes up and they started a business or they named their kid after you or something, right, something right. crazy like that. I right. love that. We were we were talking, you know, making coffee before we came up into the studio just about the the phase we're at in life as men. So we have a lot of men that listen to this, mm-hmm. business owners, business leaders, you know, guys in the in the faith space. But um, yeah, we're in interesting spots, and we kind of joked about it. We're not we're not midlife crisis, but how are you how are you navigating through just that time? Like kids moving out, getting ready to move out, getting married. You don't have to live here in Colorado anymore. Right. Like, what are some of those conversations that yeah. you're having with your wife? Because, like, Emily and I are starting to have those, too. And it's um, it's all kinds of emotions. I, I don't know about you. There's this, we have this certainty of two decades here. You've been here mm-hmm. longer than that, right, mm-hmm. in, in Fort Collins, yeah. northern Colorado? Yep. Yeah. I was yeah. born in Fort Collins. I grew up out on the eastern plains. I moved back in 2000. So um, coming on 24 years ago, we moved back. Um I love, I love this, I love this part of the world. I love the people here. I love the community, you know, this, this middle of life that we're in. Um, it's an, it's a really crazy, it's a really crazy time. So one of the things my wife and I said early on was that we didn't want to have a kid centered home. And if you look at our time, our treasure and where we put our talents, that would not indicate we don't have a kid treasure centered home. Like we put everything into our kids but what we meant by that was we didn't want our focus to be kid only. And we wanted to have, you know, we don't want to have something beyond them. And so it, it's very easy for a lot of people in our phase of life to have put all of their best into their work, into their kids, into their hobby, into their volunteerism, but not to each other. And so one thing my wife and I have done, we just from day one, we have always gotten away, just the two of us. I don't know that we've went four or five months where we haven't gotten away. And I know people that, you know, could go 15 or 20 years and never have left their family and never worked on themselves. So that's that's one thing that we had done. And, you know, I'm looking forward to the, I'm looking forward to this time when when really it's just the two of us again. Yeah. You know, like I love this woman. She's the the best thing that ever happened to me. I'm a I'm I don't even want to think about what my life would be like if I'd had to do this on my own without without her as my helpmate. And so it's a lot more exciting to me than it seems to be to her. You know, it's, it's like she's having a lot more um you know, pain and anxiety around all the kids leaving. Yeah. And, you know, I think as they, they, she carried them literally. I mean, they came from her. And so it's harder for moms to let go. Yeah. From day one, it's like my job is to kick you off the nest and to help you go be a successful, in my case, because I have all boys, a successful contributing man in, in this world. Yeah. So I'm kind of like in my glory time, and she's trying to refigure out what this looks like. And... Uh, our oldest is is 23. He's you know six years out of out of having left the house, and every year I think for both of us this becomes a bit easier because now we are parents of adult children, and what that looks like is pretty darn remarkable. And I just I just flew in last night from Arizona. I spent time with with my kids. My my oldest and I hung out. We sat courtside at at some basketball GCU basketball tournament. You know, and we went and worked out together a couple times. And you know, he worked from we he worked he works from home, so he came over to the place, and we worked. You know, he worked together, and like it's just fun to have that to look forward to. Yeah. And um, I think that I think that a lot of parents, unfortunately, tie their self worth into their kids' achievements, accomplishments. You know, what they do, where they go, instead of letting the kids bear that weight, and for them to bear the right weight. So that's that's kind of what we're focusing on right now is not not taking too much credit or identity in them and their world. Yeah. I see I see a lot of couples, right? Kids kids leave the house and then they're yeah, they're done. Yeah. Because they invested they they lost their identity in their relationship. That's been something Emily and I we've really focus on we get we get one week a year we have our date nights you know mm-hmm. frequently throughout the weeks and the months but we get one week a year where her parents take the kids we typically go hit go hit mexico just have that time to recharge and, and refresh we just told the kids something the other night 
they, they needed help. It's like, no, mom and dad are hanging out right now. Leave, leave us alone. Like yeah. this is, this is our time. It's so easy to get pulled into like kids are a huge investment, right? You can't ignore them. You got to raise them, got to yeah. raise them. Right. But missing that, missing that spouse. I mean, 20 years goes by and you don't even know who you're, who you're living with right. anymore. Yeah, well, what you did, see. what you did is a double benefit. The kids had to figure something else out on their own and you yeah. got to keep having your date night. You yep. know, it's, yeah, it's good. I love those. I love those date nights. <laughs> So, so what's, so what's next for you? Like, what are you, what are you excited about? Life, business, leadership, yeah. family. Yeah. I'm, ex- I'm, you know, I'm excited about this, this, um, pouring into my, my adult kids world and, and, and actually experiencing life through, you know, what, what they have, what they have next, whether it's family, whether it's their work, like I'm super pumped about that. I, I've, I've, in five years, all my kids will be out of the house. And in, and in five years, I want to be in a place. My goal is to be at a place where if there's a, an ability to blow a little wind in their sails, I want to do that. Whether that's coming alongside them in something they're building, whether it's helping them with their family, um, you know, whether it's helping lift some burdens that they have so that they can get away for a week in Mexico and enjoy things like that's where I want to, that's, that's what I'm pushing towards, um, from the business side of things, um, we're, we're in the process of launching something new and exciting and really taking 20 something years of, of, of experience and exposure in a couple of specific industries and, and offering, creating a completely new offering. So, um, super, super pumped about that, building out a team around that. And that's, that's fun. It's fun to have life in something new after that long. Yeah. Love that. You mentioned something. So this, this gets my mind spinning. So parents right now listening to this uh, of a child who's getting close to leaving the house or, or just leaving the house, jumping out of the nest. What have been some of those biggest lessons or pieces of advice you would share to, mm. to really, you know, contribute to their life as adults? They're not kids anymore. Yeah. Maybe where'd you get it wrong? What would be a, a couple of just good pointers? And I'm asking selfishly for me Yeah. <laughs> as well as everybody listening. Yeah. Um, I stole this statement from, from another person. But I think that by and large, our world is over mothered and under fathered. And so there's, there's this idea that we don't want our kids to experience pain, that we want to pave the way for them, that everything should be good. That when a teacher treats them unfairly, when a coach doesn't do something right, when the world, you want a boss does something inappropriate that we need to step in. And typically mom is stepping in more than dad in that. And typically dad, when dad's messing things up is not being involved. And so one of the things that, that we have, where where we have messed up is when we have together, you know, the over mother could be from mom or dad, you know, that keeping the, the pain from happening, um, you know, that's for a purpose. That's for a reason. And when you recover from your own mistake or challenge, there's good that comes from that. And so I think trying to make it so that your kids have the blessed life and no problem is not doing them any favors. Because if you look at all of us, literally all of us who are sending kids out into the world, we all had struggle and pain and frustrations and mistakes and challenges. And the problem was back then our parents didn't track our location and didn't know everything. And you know, oftentimes we had to figure that out on our own and it created the resilience that allows you to sit across from me and me to sit across from you today. Yeah. And so I think that, I think that too many, too, that's happening too much. And it's hard to, it's hard to see as a parent, right? See, see the kids go through that struggle. Like you want to swoop in. I do, you know, I was having a conversation with my daughter this morning, just about a girl giving her a hard time at school. I'm like, I want to go in there right now. I want to, I want to find the girl's dad, go talk to him. You know, I'm like, you got to go, you got to go face this. Yeah. right now and it's just painful to see so how do you how do you create those or how did you create those boundaries you know with kids that age and they're always going to be there right yeah at any any part of their journey yeah my kids are athletes so they didn't have as much opportunity to work for their experience and they competed in college and so it created less opportunities for them to have jobs or at least physical jobs because they're already doing pretty physical you know they're endurance athletes track and cross country yeah. running 50 to hundred miles a week. So to then go punch holes in the ground and plant fence posts was not also a good option or, you know, 
work in construction. So when when they had an unfair situation happen with their sports or with a roommate or, uh, you know, one of our kids went to a college his freshman year and that didn't go well and it and it ended up being a bad experience and he transferred. You know, there's a lot of things we could have done to jump in, but to like prov- provide at that point a listening ear and to wait for advice to be solicited instead of telling them what to do. Okay, here's what you need to do. You need, you know, these five things like, okay, so what are you thinking? What's What decisions are you making? What do you hope to get out of this? What are you feeling right now? And really go from from uh, parent to like mentor, mentor coach is a, it's a difficult transition. Yeah. So, you know, just allowing that frustration and and a lot of times, the kids don't need an answer. They're not looking for an answer, but that's what we give them because we are grown adults who want to solve a problem and fix it for them. Sometimes yeah. all they need to do is share their problem or their challenge. Just know that they're hurt. Yes. Yeah. And I think as men, like men want to. Fix, fix it. Everything. Yeah. So wanted to fix this this yeah. morning. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. So I, so anyway, letting them, letting them in that suffering, like if you're going to fall off a cliff and do unrepairable damage, or you're going to do something that's going to go on your record for life, I'm going to step in and keep that from happening. But aside from that, you know, a few bumps and bruises, a broken arm, a knocked tooth. I mean, like you can recover from that stuff. And I think we need to be reminded as parents that that's an, that's an okay thing. The other is, is we make it too, too easy for our kids to not have to go figure things out on their own. So we continue to fund them or we continue to let them live with us or we continue to make everything a soft landing. And I think that they've got to, you know, pretty immediately learn to contribute from them for themselves. And, you know, it's pretty remarkable the self-worth we get when we accomplish something on our own, mm-hmm. when we solve a problem on our own. And so we're doing a disservice by solving that. And and really, it's not for any good, any bad intent. You know, the, when we do that, when we do it, we do it still to this day. When we do it, it's not because I'm like, well, I'm hoping that you live a miserable existence and never learn how to, you know, recover from things. I'm like, well, let me help you out here. Yeah. And anyway, that's... Mm-hmm. That's the thought. Man, I've loved our conversation today. Thanks so much for coming out and for being here. Everybody wraps up the uh, podcast in the same way. You grabbed your, one yeah. of your favorite colors off the wall. And you've got a statement that you want to leave with the world. This has been this has been on my my heart for a long time. I actually stole this from the Bible Bible teacher at our kids' middle school uh, at, at RCS. Uh, he would say this a lot, and so this was my prayer when they were when they were young. I'd, t- I'd drive them to school before they had their license. I put my hand back, and everybody grabbed my hand. And I'd say a prayer, and three out of five days, probably, I would say this thing: "Be a burden lifter, not a burden maker. Go find someone who needs what you have and give them that today." And I am more and more convinced that the world needs us to show up as burden lifters and not burden makers. And there's a weight that we all need to carry, especially as men. And we need to make sure that we're not taking the weight we're carrying and putting on other people's shoulders. And so uh, the world is filled with burdens. And if we can help lift those and make them lighter in some way because of the way that we show up, that's great. So be a burden lifter, not a burden maker. Richard Fagerlin, my snoring roommate, (laughs) my brother. Thanks for being here. Matt, it's my pleasure. It's a wrap. Hey, if you're a faith-based father and you have a son who is entering into adolescence and manhood, you've got to check out an experience that we have June 2024. It is the father-son hike of a lifetime on the Camino de Santiago in Spain. I'm going to be taking a group of men and their sons over to Spain to hike some of the most beautiful scenery through northern Spain on the Camino de Santiago. We're going to hike six days, 70 miles, 200,000 steps, and have completely disconnected, unplugged, uninterrupted time with our sons. We are going to grow and bond and deepen our relationships with our sons through some very intentionally curated adventures, challenges, and experiences. And we're going to do so in the company of other faith-based men who have the same desire to grow and deepen their story with their son. If you're interested in this adventure with us, go to mattshalp.com, click the Go to Spain button, and check out the Father-Son Hike of a Lifetime.